Well, I'm very excited to be here, and um, it's I haven't been to EDW in a long time, and it's really exciting, energizing to me to see the passion of all the data people. So I hope that um, I can be a partner for you and a partner with you on this journey as you know we deal with all these newfangled things that are coming up for us. The one thing I would um, caution is, you know, this is a very, very special time of the day. And after lunch, people can sort of sleep with their eyes open. <laughs> so we just have to watch out for that. So, um, you know, why did um, I get interested in this um, security, clouds, and all of these um, items? So before we start, I would like you to take a moment and see where you place yourself on the capability maturity model today. Where do you think you or your organization are in the information management maturity model? And we'll do like one, two, three, four, till 10, not till 50. <laughs> So everybody had a chance to think of a number, maybe half number, 2.5. 2.5 is my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So everybody had a chance to sort of situate yourself to where you think you are and your organizations are in this? OK. So we'll come back to us at the end of the presentation and talk about that a little more. So um, what I'm going to talk about is basically what, you know, you hear all the speakers say challenges and possible solutions. I'm not providing definitive solutions, but a path forward for thinking about solutions and a framework in which you can do the solutions that your organization needs for its specific requirements. So there are evolving compliance challenges. And if we go to the cloud and if, as we are doing more outsourcing, more partnering, more service providers, uh, compliance challenges become more and more important. And um, I am uh, proposing that us data people become partners with the security people. You know, they have the same thing. Nobody likes them, nobody likes us. So <laughs> we can all be partners together. So I'm gonna use um, a case study or a, a framework for a biotech pharma company to just walk through this journey today. So. Um, how do in information services enable a global pharma business? So what happens? There are physicians worldwide. Uh, prescriptions are written worldwide. Uh, clinical trials have to be done uh, to make sure that the drugs can be approved. And um, clinical trial, you know, we are having a hard time finding patients in the US. So more and more clinical trials are being done outside the US. Then there are health authorities in each country. Fortunately, in EU, at least 25 countries have only one authority. But if you think of Central America, all those little tiny countries, they have their own health authorities. And they do not even agree on how to uh, license a drug among each other. They're trying to have a single standard, but they're not there. So you have, if you want to s sell even one pill in that country, you have to deal with the country's health authority. Plus, you have a whole supply chain, right? So you have to supply the drugs, both for the trials as well as for what is already on the market. And um, you could have um, you know, manufacturers in China. You could have a lot of manufacturing in Singapore, in Brazil. So where do drugs go from which manufacturer? And how are they licensed? Which package do they go in? You know? We don't have RFIDs yet. So um, how, how does technology help? In addition to running the usual business, we need a lot of business information, especially when a uh, lot of outsourcing is being done, whole business process outsourcing is being done. And we need to manage risk and compliance. And there are a lot of partners. There are lot partners to do clinical trials. There are partners to manufacture the product. And then we need to help uh, monitor their operations. You know, FDA doesn't care. If you're going to sell something in the US, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It has to be GMP compliant, and you have to monitor that. So given this is our world, 
what happens? We are doing, we are going along, the business is running, everything is running fine. Then the Sunshine Act comes from part of the healthcare law. Earlier, different states were making different laws. You know, California was very strict, Minnesota was very strict. But the good thing is that the Sunshine Act unified them all. But what does it mean? It means if a physician is paid anything by a sponsoring organization which is worth $100, you have to record it and you have to send these reports to the government. And um, even if your company doesn't make any promotional materials over $25, or even over $100, but let's say a salesperson goes, buys a doctor a coffee from Starbucks, they have to keep track of it. Maybe if they buy you know, 20 coffees, it'll add up to over $100. Then if a company sponsors a continuing med uh, education uh, seminar or a conference, you know, just like we are all here, and a physician attends the conference, and the lunch is provided, they have to figure out what was the cost of the lunch. Whether the physician ate the lunch, went off to see an emergency patient or not. It doesn't matter whether they ate it or not. But if the lunch was provided, you have to track that. And just think, how many continuing education providers are there? Are we supposed to collect all the uh, conference data from them? Then how are they tracking their physicians? They're keeping their physicians as, you know, physician ABC, Dr. Smith, Dr. Brown. But how do we know it's the same physician? So before we can aggregate the data and report, we need to know master data management, and we need to know who are all those service providers and keep track of all of them. Then another thing happens. Oh, we are a science company. A scientist discovers a new test. You know, they are always discovering new tests. They want us to have personalized healthcare. Most of your doctors want you to have personalized healthcare. You want personalized healthcare. You don't care if, you know, your cousin, your sister, your friend took this dose of the drug. You want to know what dose of the drug is right for you. Also, you want to know if there are 10 drugs on the market, which one will work best for you. So to do that, the Physicians need to know more about you. So to do that, they have tests. What do they measure? They have all these biomarkers sitting in your blood, right? They're trying to figure out which of those biomarkers are significant and which will make a difference. So let's say a scientist discovers a new test. Now they want samples. Well, clinical trials have been done worldwide. One clinical trial has about 1,000 or 2,000 patients. All those samples are there right? They need to know, oh, okay, maybe I want females, non-smokers between 30 to 50 years of age. They want to find those samples. Can we give them those samples? Have we tracked if those samples have consent associated with it? Were they consented once? Was the consent to use sample in the research has been withdrawn or not? So these are just few examples of what is the real world out there and why this data management is really, really significant and has enough challenges of its own without bringing security into the picture. So this is just an example. You know, in the box, you have uh, internal systems. Outside in the cloud, you have a CRM system. You have an uh, electronic data capture system for uh, doing uh, trials. Then, um, since the trials are actually uh, done by physicians, uh, the samples go to the labs. There are CROs who actually uh, contract research organizations which actually conduct the trials. They find the patients. They enroll the patients. They have their own systems. Hospital labs do their tests. They have samples. There are sample repositories. You cannot possibly keep all those samples in freezers. You know, you'll have, just like we have, a whole farm of servers, we'll have a whole farm of freezers, so there are repositories which hold samples for you, and then there are special labs for doing special assets. So you see just with a tiny glimpse of where all samples can be, you know, you all participate in healthcare. If you're not part of a Kaiser or a big HMO, this is happening to your samples too. They're all over the place, even if you're not in a trial. Um, same thing for physician data. So I'm going to use this as an example for master data to carry forward. So um, as I was saying earlier about the Sunshine Act, 
So we have contracts with the physicians, contracts with the education uh, providers, grants that are provided, um, prescriptions um, are written, and um, people who are in healthcare already know this, but if you look at your prescription uh, bottle, there is an NDC number on it. So every prescription is individually tracked. And then there are aggregators who aggregate that prescription information and sell it to um, companies. And then um, you could base your um, salespeople's compensation on it. Uh, you could track your operations based on that. And you could do a lot of different activities based on that. So a lot of this data is um, already available. And um, AMA keeps track of um, all the physicians. There are state licensing boards uh, through which the physicians are licensed. And um, of course, they are affiliated with multiple clinics. They are affiliated with multiple hospitals. So one has to keep track of all the uh, physicians, all their relationships to the clinics by where they provide clinical information, plus their contractual organizations. Is the clinic part of a group purchasing organization? Does the clinic get its drug from a discounter? And do they get discount ab about those drugs? Do they get specialty drugs? Do they take the drug and they may get 100 bucks of pills? Do they take them out and split them into 10 boxes each? And then that's how they dispense it. So all that information um, about the physician and the organizations to which the physicians are affiliated with is also tracked. So now let's bring some security components to it. So as we know, we already have a data uh, in a cloud. We already have a software as a service provider. So do we know uh, which um, uh, clouds are hosting this data? Do we know at those sites who has access to that data? You know, we assume we may have contractual terms when we do the contract with the service provider who has access, but most contracts are not written that way. Then do we know who could access it, but do we know who actually accessed it? So if it's patient data, if it's HIPAA compliant data, even if it is anonymized or de-identified, you may want to know who is accessing your data. Then do we know what are the trends and patterns of the data access? So um, you may have seen the news report of the Octomom. Um, you know, how was that information leaked? that information was leaked by an unauthorized access of the patient information. So people had access, but they were not supposed to access that information. Same thing, you might have uh, uh, read about in the news about the case um, uh, of uh, Stanford Hospital. So uh, Stanford Hospital had a, a third party service provider. They took some patient data for their business but for whatever reason, they posted it on as a sample data for teaching Excel pivot tables. That data was out there for almost one year. And a patient found it and reported to Stanford. Stanford talked to the site. They took it down right away. So how would you even know what is happening to your data? And that is really the essence of the security challenge that we face today. So um, are we monitoring the access? You know, my co-presenter who's not here, he always says there is no control if there is no monitoring, right? I mean, he's a security guy. So, and we data people know, do we monitor? We have all these policies, we do a lot of aggregation, we may monitor our data warehouses. Do, are we truly monitoring data access and trends of data access? Who is accessing what? Absolutely not. That is not our priority. Very, very few people have that as a priority. Then how automated is it? I mean, security people could keep us busy with BI solutions. We could give them so much BI, <laughs> you know, they, uh, uh, big data. We could uh, be analyzing logs for them, and you would have a big data warehouse for them. So is there a monitoring alert if access patterns change? Absolutely not. You know, there may be some areas where this happens, but in many, many areas, it doesn't happen. And in security, there are tools. Tools are coming up into security. They have different kinds of tools than us data uh, tools. So 
to me, if we can bring the two parties together and start having conversations about data, tools, and capabilities, hopefully we can take a leap forward rather than just steps forward. So what are the risks if you put the data in the cloud? And we have talked about some of them. So data could be shared with unknown or unwanted third parties. Um, what are the legal rights and what is the regulatory authority? So for example, if you have um, you know, um, your email on the cloud and as, uh, with Google, then the Justice Department could subpoena Google. They would provide them the information, and they could run you know, those email trackers as it. You would never know that. Same thing if an education um, school or a school district takes, um, uses Google email, then the Department of Education requires that student records need to be kept on US soil. Well, is, you know, Google is changing its policy to make sure that they can decide where the data is and it's not distributed, you know, replicated in their data centers worldwide. Do we know who's, what, who's doing what with that data that we have you know, placed on the cloud? Are people aggregating it? Are they replicating it, disseminating it, dispersing it? You know, this is sort of this you know, situation with um, the Stanford case. And as more and more of outsourcing and cloud uh, hosting happens, it becomes an increasing risk. Then um, when we do contracts with the cloud service providers, they have their own terms. They may limit liability, they may terminate service, they may limit data access to our own data. You know, are we protecting ourselves from that? Um, what reliabilities and guarantees do they offer for um, lost data? Will somebody hold our data hostage, right? So it's very, very interesting world if we start thinking from a security mindset. So what I'm proposing is that um, we have a framework in which we take capabilities from the data management framework and we also take capabilities from the security management framework and bring the two um, together. So like any, frame, uh, like any other solution, we'll have a strategy, a framework, and uh, how do we sustain this um, in the enterprise. So first of all, we have to decide on our strategy. What is our strategy going to be? The biggest thing that is uh, missing is some sort of a risk assessment. For data, we do not have uh, uh, any basis of risk. If we don't have a risk classification, we cannot do threat or uh, mitigation analysis. Then we need to decide, you know, what kind of a cloud are we going to use? Are we going to put our data in a, cl a cloud which is of less business risk, or are we going to put data, any data on the cloud? So that is a significant item to figure out upfront, or at least have some guidelines, guidelines or have some idea so that when a business uh, function wants to say, oh, I hired this person. They have a great hosted solution. I'm going to use them. You know whether that business function can be hosted on that kind of a cloud or not. And uh, also, if possible, if you can qualify your providers, if you could qualify your um, infrastructure as a service provider, software as a service provider, that way you know which of those solutions are already available to the enterprise. So if people want those solutions, then you have already qualified your IAS vendors and SAS vendors, so at least you have a head start and you're not, uh, you know, you don't have to play catch up when the business function wants to do something. And the same thing with partners. So more and more um, collaborations are happening, more and more uh, business process outsourcing is happening. So we do not even talk security to them. We may talk about data exchange to them or for data integration purposes, but we really do not talk about um, uh, anything about their security when we are thinking of how we are going to integrate with their uh, sources. So having um, deciding on these items forms the scope of your endeavor. So if you're going to go back and talk about to your security colleagues, you want to at least pick something and have a small scope to start with. Then, uh, like I said earlier, basically we are going to bring practices from data management as well as uh, practices from uh, 
security and bring the two together. And as you know, in data management, we always start with master data. And even if we have master data, we want to identify some key attributes. And the whole reason of doing master data is so that we can do information transfer and information exchange. Also, we have a basis for information aggregation and information integration, which we usually do in our warehouse environments. And exchanges we do either with partners outside or with the systems inside the company. So I'm not going to uh, stay with this. You all know this. And we all know what uh, master data is. So coming to uh, what is really important from a security perspective. There is a secure, and I mean, some of you are here from uh, the financial industry, the insurance and banks. They really have done, uh, they are more ahead of pharma or biotechs in terms of their data security classification. So you may say this is public data, this is private or internal data, this is confidential or da uh, data for restricted use. Then access. We talked about access a little uh, earlier. Who is accessing this data? And what are our controls for access and data distribution? And are we monitoring them? And what are the policies? And how are we tracking compliance against those policies? So bringing these two frameworks from um, security and data, what would it look like? So it would look like having some sort of a security classification for your master data. Let's say if we start there. So if you have a customer, and uh, the customer is, let's say, a physician, because we talked about physicians earlier, we may not care about prescribers. Prescriber information may be public information. Anybody can get the, uh, the directory of physicians in the US. You know, there are about a million or so physicians. You can get their directory. AMA sells that data. So prescriber information may not be public information. But there are certain thought leaders. There are certain experts in certain fields. Somebody may be an expert in oncology. Somebody may be an expert in immunology. That may be internal data for the company. So they may want to say, take the uh, key attributes or characteristics that we already have for our physician data whether it's their license number, whether it's their NPI number, and add the security classification that is relevant to your organization as an attribute to that master data. Um, then the same thing um, for uh, access. So uh, let's say, you know, we usually know who is accessing the information from a security perspective, because security people are really, really good at managing parties. Right? I mean, identity management is all about managing parties and their user IDs. Anybody who has an interest in the company, they have a user ID. Whether you are a permanent employee, you are a consultant, you are a contractor, you are a partner, you are an outsource, you are uh, coming from the outsourcing place, all of you, if you're going to access the system from that enterprise, you have a user ID. And there are a lot of tools to ma do the identity management and the authorization and access management. But we usually don't bring that together into the other master, with the other master data and bring it together with the master data framework. So, but in addition to who has access, which is the authorization and uh, authentication, now we all, all, uh, already need to know what devices are there, uh, uh, you know, getting the uh, information on, or what device is the access on? And as, you know, bring your own device grows into enterprises, it becomes uh, important. Then a location becomes important. Where is this being accessed, right? You have your own device, you know, are you on holiday in the Bahamas and you are accessing this information? Are you supposed to be accessing this information outside the US? Do you have a reason for it? Is your device lost? You know, should they have access patterns for this? Did somebody you know, take your device? So this is really, really important. So if, let's say somebody is in uh, crucial manufacturing for the, uh, in the manufacturing supply chain for the data, and they have mobile access, you re and they are traveling, you really, really need to know what kind of information is being accessed and who is doing the access. 
So um, for master data management, um, I'm proposing that in addition to existing master data categories, which we have when, who, where, whose, that come from the data side, we also add attribution for the security pieces also. So usually our databases do a very good job of who and when, right? I mean, this is sort of the third generation of data management. We have a lot of best practices. We have a lot of lessons learned. We have versioning. We have controls. Uh, we have a lot more tools than we used to have. So who and when are pretty well co covered. But where? When we do the organization models, we may say where the organization business units are located, but we are not talking about where the master data is located. So we can enhance that capability and uh, add the where. So that way, I mean, some of you have um, um, you know, tools in which these capabilities are already uh, provided. And um, the other additional aspect is there are multiple parties who are controlling our data. So who has control of it and whose governance are they under? So we would need to add those. We already talked about security classification and we already talked about um, uh, devices. So and sustaining is uh, pretty much the same thing, right? Security has their own steering committees. Data has their own steering committees. IT strategy has their own steering committees usually. So if we could bring the, those three groups together and have an engagement model with the business where we have an information security strategy, where we bring all those people together, we identify for the business which kind of data do they want to start this information security strategy with. It, it would be different for different business and that because the risks for different businesses are different. And then basically use uh, what security and data people all, always do, the governance models, having some, um, and policies. And I think the security people have more metrics. So if we can bring those two together, then we have a great framework for establishing a risk uh, strategy for information management or inf secure information management um, for the business. So this is just sort of putting the whole, all, all, all the pieces together. We talked about strategy. We said start with a small scope, maybe one entity or one business unit that would work. And then uh, follow through with the security uh, classification, expand your master data solution. And then um, once that is done and you're ready to move on, then you can uh, add uh, 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 information exchange and information aggregation capabilities also. And then basically monitoring, monitoring, and monitoring. So um, what can you do when you go back? Uh, maybe go have lunch with the security folks. Uh, maybe attend one of their security governance meeting. Maybe invite them to the data meeting because there is a lot they could learn from data management practices because security practices are, you know, have traditionally been about risks. And uh, help uh, the enterprise create a data map. So whatever scope you pick out, see where that data is located. And then um, add the security attributes, maybe five, two to five, you know, would be a great place to start. So um, what are the critical success factors here? You know, you've heard this before, you've done this before, a lot of you have championed the, uh, you know, uh, maturity in the, uh, Data world, you know, um, I remember to me, this is the third wave of data, you know, client server and all the data was all, all over the map. Then this whole BI data warehousing, oh, data people were important again, and now with big data and all the cloud, you know, and doing integration. So this is a tremendous opportunity. And um, the security people are also good at managing exceptions. You know, we data people sometimes get caught up in the exceptions. We try, try, try to follow or make rules and business rules for all the exceptions. But security people are really better at uh, exception handling. If there is an incident, if there is a security incident in your company, there is 
a structure and a framework and a method to respond to that incident. So if we could learn from that, and you know, instead of just physical uh, security, we could also bring that capability into data security, we would have a huge leg forward. Then um, tools are evolving. There are a lot of standards out there. And you know, standards are friends. We love standards, so the more standards, the better. So if we can adopt the standards framework, whichever is applicable to your industry. You know, for us in healthcare, CDISC was a standard. And now uh, HL7 is becoming a standard. And CDISC and HL7, they're trying to bridge them together uh, for going forward. It'll happen one day. Um, uh, responsibilities, I think that's another area where we could learn from uh, security and partner with security. What are the responsibilities of the vendor from a data security aspect? Of, we talked about risks before. What is important to your solution and what is important to your business? And you want to put that in contractual terms. So coming back to this. So let's say you are all in the cloud. Would you be able to sustain the same maturity level without doing extra steps? Or if you go beyond the enterprise, you will have to do extra steps to maintain that uh, maturity level. And then if you want to advance on the model, then of course, more work, right? So to me, this is really, really an exciting time to be an information management professional, right? There is so much data. You know, a single ge a full genome analysis of one person is two terabytes. There is not enough bandwidth to load that into the cloud. There is a company in China, and there's another company in the US. Mostly, they are, they are the ones who are sequencing the full genome. How are they sending this data to the scientists? They put it in hard drives, and it comes on FedEx. <laughs> so, you know, it's really, really exciting to be at this point in this time. I mean, you could, uh, I heard somebody talk from eBay. They have amazing solutions for provisioning and analysis in real time. So if one could take their this big data analytics and apply that on the genome, it will be very, very interesting for the scientists. So um, there's more information, there's a lot of instrument data, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of people talk about the Internet of Things, you know, so all that data already exists. And for us in the biotech pharma industry, as we go into more and more personalized healthcare, they want to do all kinds of tests and collect all the data in addition to your genome and figure out what makes you so special. So um, there are new technologies. There are a lot of database technologies. I know some people have presentations uh, in this conference about that. You know, column databases. You know, all these Cassandra, Hadoops, and all that that you have already uh, heard about. How do they play together? A lot more tools for semantic correlation. We don't need to do um, integration and aggregation just by attributes anymore. We could use semantic tools and we could have a hybrid solution with syntactical and semantic solutions to do these correlations and also mobility, right? So there's data, data, data everywhere. And the more we can do with it, the more tools we can have, the more value we can provide to the business. So that's all I have. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, comments, you would like to share experiences, which I should have said before, please feel free. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. You know, um, I think different um, companies have, d um, legal have different sensitivities. So there is really no solution. To me, the best thing is don't put it on the cloud, <laughs> right? I mean, that's your scope. That is in your, you want to see, is it high, medium, and low risk from a legal perspective for your company? If it is a high risk, don't put it. If it's a low or a medium risk, 
then you have to run it by Beagle. I mean, for us, uh, electronic lab notebooks is a big deal. Intellectual property, you know, is very, very significant. So having electronic lab notebooks, which were hosted, would not make legal comfortable. You know, they couldn't defend intellectual property cases. So it's a very, very tough decision. And that's why it's really important to think ahead, because otherwise cases like this happen. And you know, the business is excited, IT is excited, we are excited by new tools, we want to put it out there, we want to make it available to everybody. So any other comments, questions, thoughts? Uh-huh. Yeah, I think verification part is still tricky and um, data verification has not been significant for a while. And um, I heard the gentleman before lunch speak about information architecture. So even if it is redundancy on the cloud, he talked about a settlement and that's usually what is in most of the architectures. So even if you have data replicated and across partitions, there is a synchronization schedule. It may not be the synchronization schedule that meets your business needs, but usually there is a synchronization schedule and that does take care of it. I mean, that's one of the advantage uh, of going to the cloud and taking that capacity. Any other comments, questions? Is there anybody from the finance industry? Do you have good uh, interface between security and data people? They talk well together? Uh huh. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Right. I see. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, that's wonderful to hear. How about? I don't know that I have a lot to contribute. Our security is so strong that it's in the more traditional world. Uh huh. And so we're not ready to get to the right. Right. So yeah, I really can't speak to it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Otherwise, thank you so much.